Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to this uh, third session, which I have the pleasure of introducing. I'm Richard Hines. Um, our first speaker is our leader, Tyler Jacks. Um, barely needs any introduction, but I'll do one anyway. Um, so Tyler got his first degree at Harvard, where he, he lived in Jim Watson's old office, and somewhere around the Coke, there's still the door plate that says J.D. Watson that Tyler absconded with. And after that, he went to UCSF to do his PhD with uh, Harold Varmus. And he came back east and did a postdoc with Bob Weinberg. And we, we have a tradition at MIT of not hiring postdocs but we, from within. But we broke that tradition very wisely, I think, in the case of Tyler. And uh, he joined the faculty in the in 93, I think it was. And uh, 92, he says, OK. Um, and. Uh, has done wonderfully well, and as soon as I could, I got him to take over as director of the Cancer Center, which he's done a wonderful job uh, leading the Coke and developing it into its current state and setting up meetings such as this. So uh, he's been director for 14 years, still looking pretty good. So, <laughs> so Tyler's going to talk, talk to us about engineering the cancer genome, uh, particularly in mouse models, of which he's a great expert. So thanks, Tyler. Well, thanks very much, Richard. Uh, it's it's uh, appropriate to point out that we have the Koch Institute Symposium um, because the first year that I became director, um, we developed a symposium in honor of Richard Hines, the outgoing director, and we liked what happened there, so we decided to keep doing it, and we're still doing it today. Um, despite the fact that this is 14 years in, this is the very first time I've given a talk at the Koch Institute Symposium, so I'm very grateful to Mike Heeman for offering me a speaking slot in today's program. I think that Mike was just sucking up, but I'll take it anyway. Um, as Richard said, my lab studies um, cancer genetics using mouse models, and a very common model that we use, and the one that I'll talk about ex exclusively today, is a model of lung adenocarcinoma, um, which involves mutations in two commonly mutated genes in human lung adenocarcinoma, KRAS and P53. We use Crelox regulatable systems to activate RAS and inactivate P53 in individual cells within the lung. These develop into <clears throat> localized tumors, which will eventually metastasize and eventually kill the animal. Um, we bring Cre into the system on the back of a virus, typically these days a lentivirus, um, and that's very powerful because in addition to bringing in Cre, um, in more recent years we've also bring, brought in other genes. And this allows us to modify the genomes of the cancer cells in very specific ways, to study the biology of those cells, to mark those cells, to inhibit pathways within those cells, and, and in, in those different ways, understand what's happening. And you have a great deal of flexibility in this approach. Um, one can put in cDNAs and microRNAs and shRNAs, and you'll, as you'll hear towards the end, sgRNAs uh, to mutate additional genes. And in addition, one can use different promoters uh, ubiquitous promoters or TET regulatable promoters or pathway-specific promoters um, to, again, modify those cells in very unique and specific ways. Now, when you develop tumors in this model, they develop over time. They evolve um, from atypical adenomatous hyperplasias to well-differentiated adenomas. They then change and become more um, heterogeneous tumors histologically. They become adenocarcinomas, which become invasive, um, again, become different over time, they evolve over time, and ultimately become metastatic and change thereby once again. And so in keeping with the theme of today's presentation or, or uh, symposium, I'd like to talk about the mechanisms of developing um, heterogeneity as these tumors evolve over time. What is the underlying basis of this uh, evolutionary change? Now you might think, and it's been confirmed by multiple speakers so far today, that that change would occur genetically. That is to say, following the programming of KRAS and P53 mutations in these cells, over time the cells would acquire additional mutations, and those mutations would be driving the changed phenotypes that we observe in the model. But in fact, uh, David McFadden, when he was in the lab collaborating with uh, Katie Paletti and uh, Greg Hannon and Harold Varmus and Gaddy Getz and others have looked at the genomes of these cancer cells, and they are remarkably free of additional somatic mutations. The mutation rate within these developing tumors in the mouse models is very, very low. Um, what we found was that on average, these tumors acquire about 12 additional mutations, which is way, way fewer than what you find in human cancers. Uh, and we find, found no examples of recurrently mutated genes. 
And so, in fact, we have no evidence that there are necessary second genetic events that are taking place within tumor progression in this model. It's possible that RAS and P53 mutation alone is all you need genetically, and that the other things are happening through other mechanisms. So what might those other mechanisms be? Well, one possibility for which we have evidence is epigenetic heterogeneity, that things are changing based on gene expression changes within individual clones in the developing tumor, and this confers the altered phenotypes that we observe. And the first evidence that we had for that came in the hands of uh, Monty Winslow and Talia Dayton, who observed that a transcription factor that's required for lung differentiation called NKX 2.1, which was expressed extensively in the early stage, well-differentiated cells that look like lung epithelial cells, um, that pattern of expression changed from being high in the early stage tumors to being low, and really non-existent in the late stage tumors. So the cells were losing the expression of this lineage-restricted transcription factor, losing their differentiated capability, uh, and indeed began to upregulate factors associated with less well-differentiated, in fact, embryonic cells, including HMGA2, which is normally restricted to embryogenesis, becomes re-expressed uh, in these late-staged tumors. We could also see this transition happen in time in individual tumors. Here's an example of a of a tumor in transition. It's got a component that's NKX 2.1 positive and a component that N, that's NKX 2.1 negative. This is presumably a clone of cells developing within the tumor that's lost NKX 2.1 expression, become less locked into the lung differentiation phenotype, and is beginning to evolve. This is not genetic. We know that because we've sequenced NKX 2.1, but rather it's silencing, epigenetic inactivation. Now, Carmen Lee followed up these studies and has now realized that this process is much more complex. It's not simply the shutting off of this one transcription factor that unlocks the differentiation potential of these cells, but in fact, it's a staged event that requires the inactivation of a series of transcription factors. Um, this is a complex slide, but I'll make the point simply. Um, what you're looking at is three tumors from left to right. Uh, and the staining of three different, actually four different transcriptional regulators, NKX 2.1 and FOXA2, which are normally expressed in the lung and are involved in lung-specific differentiation, CDX2, which is normally not expressed in the lung but instead in the intestine, and HMGA2, which I already mentioned, which is not expressed in any adult tissue but is only embryonic in origin. In the early stage tumors, the lung-specific transcription factors are expressed, and CDX2 is not, and HMGA2 is not. In an intermediate phase of disease development, HM, um, NKX 2.1 and uh, FOXA2 levels decrease, they get inhibited, and now we see the emergence of expression of CDX2, which is normally only expressed in the intestinal epithelial lineage. So this is sort of a backup transcriptional program that takes over when the primary transcriptional program is lost. And then only at later stages is CDX2 expression extinguished, and then HMDGA2 levels uh, come on. So this is a series of transcriptional inhibition steps that allows the cells to lose various differentiation states and become poorly differentiated and more embryonic in nature. These are not just markers, but in fact, Carmen has studied the effects of inhibition of these uh, transcription factors on the biology of, the cell, of these cells using uh, shRNA inhibition of NKX 2.1 and FOXA2 and, CDX, and CDX2. Um, either alone or in combination, including elimination of all three, and she observes that when she gets rid of all three of these transcription factors and, and again, um, uh, eliminates the ability of these cells to differentiate in these various ways, the cells become poorly differentiated, as shown on the upper right, and those cells have increased capacity for metastasis in a transplantation assay. So this form of epigenetic heterogeneity um, leading to a cell with less differentiated characteristics, more embryonic, perhaps more stem-like characteristics, we think is very important in underlying the progression uh, in this disease model. Uh, so that summarizes that portion. And the fact that the cells become more embryonic as they develop into later stages of progression makes us think about um, stem cells and poorly differentiated cells. And of course, cancer stem cells are another important topic as we think about uh, intratumoral heterogeneity. Cancer stem cells might represent subpopulations within cancers that are important in propagating the tumor over time, perhaps being the cells that seed metastases, perhaps being the cells that are resistant to uh, chemotherapy. Cancer stem cells have been studied in this model previously. Erica Jackson, who's somewhere in the audience, has demonstrated that the notch one signaling pathway is important uh, in subpopulations of cells within this tumor model. But more recently, Tuomas Tamala in my lab um, has explored 
the possibility that the Wnt signaling pathway, another important stem cell pathway, might be important in this disease state. And uh, this is the Wnt pathway simplified. You probably know that it's an important developmental pathway and an important stem cell pathway. It's a very important pathway in colon cancer development. It's normally regulated by uh, Wnt growth factors which bind to frizzled receptors. Um, this is potentiated by binding of R spondin factors to the LGR family of receptors. And together this leads to the uh, stabilization of beta catenin which moves to the nucleus and drives the expression of genes important in stem cell function. So Tuomas wanted to ask whether the Wnt signaling pathway might be important in this tumor model and maybe be a marker of cancer stem cells as well. And so we looked using nuclear beta catenin staining of tumors in the so-called KP model. And as you can see here by the arrows, he found that indeed there were cells within these tumors that had nuclear beta catenin. And importantly, it wasn't all the cells within the tumor, but individual cells um, scattered throughout the tumor. So this was consistent with the notion that the Wnt pathway was on and perhaps on in specialized subpopulations of cells. Tuomas then went further and asked, using one of these bifunctional antiviral vectors that expressed the GFP gene from a promoter that is sensitive to Wnt signaling, could he mark individual cells within one of these tumors? And indeed, as you can see here in green, there are, again, Wnt pathway positive cells scattered throughout uh, these developing KP tumors, consistent with the notion that these might be stem cells and cells that were important in the propagation of the developing tumor. Now, if these cells are important in the propagation of the developing tumor, if you could mark those cells at this time point and then follow the descendants of those cells over time, you would observe that these cells would increase in proportion compared to the non-pathway positive cells. And fortunately, thanks to work from Hans Klaver's lab, we can do that. Uh, Hans Klaver's had developed uh, this knock-in mouse shown here, which expresses both GFP and the Cree enzyme fused to estrogen receptor make, to make it tamoxifen sensitive to the LGR5 promoter, which as I mentioned is a receptor for the r spondins, but is also a target gene of Wnt signaling. So when the Wnt, when the Wnt pathway is on, LGR5 is on, Cree is on, and uh, GFP is on, and Cree is on, waiting to be activated by tamoxifen. Tuomas obtained this strain and then crossed it to a version of the KP mouse, here using flip frit technology instead of Cree Lox technology. This is the most complex genotype I'll show you today, so it doesn't get any worse than this. Uh, this is the LGR5 Cree ER knock in strain combined with RAS P53 controlled by Flip Frit. And then we also have a tomato allele which can be activated by Cree. And so the experiment is shown here. You take that mouse with that complex genotype, allow it to develop a tumor following the addition of adeno flip, and then pulse the mouse with a little bit of tamoxifen. And what you observe then is a small cluster of RFP positive cells, which represent those cells that had the Wnt pathway on at the time that you did the tamoxifen exposure. And then you can wait and ask what happens to that clone of cells over time. If those cells are no more capable of propagating the tumor than the rest of the cells in the tumor at that time, their proportion won't change over time, as shown in the middle. If they're less able to propagate the tumor, you'll see fewer of those cells over time. But if those are the cells that propagate the tumor, their proportion within the tumor mass will increase. This is a lineage marking experiment um, looking at the effect of cancer stem cells here marked by the Wnt pathway uh, in this model system. So what does it look like in fact? Um, when Tuomas pulses these animals with tamoxifen, once again, you see patchy positive staining here for RFP, which is indicative of those cells that had the pathway on at the time that you added tamoxifen. You can then wait, in this case four weeks, and observe quite impressively that large swaths of the tumor are now, com are now composed of the cells that descended from those Wnt pathway positive cells. This, in my view, is the best demonstration of cancer stem cells being this propagating cell type within a naturally arising tumor. Now, the fact that those cells are so important in allowing the tumor to grow over time suggests that the Wnt pathway might be an important therapeutic target for cancer. And so Tuomas has begun to do experiments to explore that in the mouse system. Uh, he's obtained an inhibitor of the Wnt pathway called LGK974, which is a porcupine pathway inhibitor for those in the know. Uh, it's a Wnt pathway inhibitor. And he's treated mice with these KP tumors to see what the effect is. And as you can see on the left in the graph, when you treat animals with tumors with this inhibitor, the Wnt pathway specific genes are reduced. 
This is evidence that the pathway was on and that the inhibitor is in fact affecting uh, pathway activity. But more importantly, when he looks at the effect on tumor growth over time, here with a tumor that's expressing luciferase to mark the tumor cells, uh, we could observe that in contrast to the control which tumors continue to grow, the animals treated with the pathway inhibitor uh, indeed show tumor growth inhibition. This is an ongoing study. There's still more mice to be dosed. Uh, but early signs look, I think, very encouraging, that the pathway might be very important in this tumor model and possibly also ultimately in humans. So this uh, part sort of summarizes our view of heterogeneity as it exists in the development of this tumor, perhaps a little bit of genetic heterogeneity, but only a little bit, certainly quite a bit of epigenetic heterogeneity, and some form of, I would say, cell state heterogeneity involving stem cells, uh, including those expressing the Wnt pathway. So I want to move now and talk about a different form of heterogeneity, not intratumoral heterogeneity, but rather intertumoral heterogeneity. The fact that if we think about human lung cancers, no two lung cancers are the same, as previous speakers talked about. They all have their own specific collection of mutations. Uh, and this is really quite an impressive and impressively complex uh, problem, as the other speakers have described. This is certainly true in lung cancers. Lung cancers have, on average, a few hundred or more um, non-synonymous non, uh, non mutations, protein-altering mutations, including, as shown here in a TCGA study published recently, uh, under the leadership of Matt Meyerson, several cancer driver genes. There are 18 genes on this list that are mutated at appreciable frequency in a large sample of human lung adenocarcinomas. Um, satisfyingly, KRAS and P53 are, the, are, the, are at the top of this list, but there are a lot of other genes on this list as well that get mutated in human lung cancers. And each human tumor, as you can see by the, by the columns, has a different collection of mutations. And for those of us in the cancer modeling field, this is actually an overwhelming task to begin to model all of those different combinations to create model systems in which to study the disease. Because for us, to do that, as I've talked about already, requires complex breeding experiments. If you were interested in a particular gene, gene A, to see what its effects were on lung cancer development, you'd have to make or, or obtain a mouse with a mutation in that gene, then cross it into the cancer-prone strain, and then ultimately get enough mice with that genotype to carry out a tumor study. This would take you at least two or three years to do, and several hundred thousand dollars as well. Um, and given the number of genes that are mutated in human lung cancer, if you want to do this for every last one and combinations of them, it's really a very, very daunting task. Uh, and so collectively, we as a lab, and I think we as a field, uh, we're becoming quite depressed. Um, and honestly, members of my lab, strikingly only the male members of my lab, began to uh, sob uncontrollably. <laughs> and so then we began to look to the heavens, uh, and we prayed. And fortunately, the skies began to part, and delivered unto us was CRISPR. <laughs> and it was good. CRISPR, as you know, is a, is a um, system of bacterial immunity that is uh, a very powerful way to introduce double-strand breaks into DNA of bacterial cells. Um, thanks to the work of uh, Charpentier and Doudna, the system was simplified to just two components, an enzyme called Cas9 and a single guide RNA that could guide Cas9 basically to anywhere or almost anywhere in the genome to direct a double-strand break in that region. Uh, thanks to work of Feng Zhang here at MIT and George Church, as well as the Doudna lab, this was transported into mammalian cells to show that one could do genome editing very efficiently in mammalian cells. Um, once you introduce a double-strand break in your favorite gene, uh, the cell will go about trying to repair that break either by non-homologous end joining, which is an error-prone process that will lead to, very often lead to insertion or deletion mutations, causing typically loss of function mutations. Um, and if you apply a homologous recombination donor at the same time, um, one can transfer the mutations present within that donor into the genome also very efficiently. And this system has been used by lots of workers in the field now over the last couple of years to modify cells, to modify um, embryonic stem cells, to modify zygotes, to do screens of various kinds. It's an extremely powerful technology. We decided now just a couple of years ago to see whether we could use this technology to modify genes, specifically cancer genes, directly in the mouse to bypass the need of making germline mutations and go directly uh, into the animal. And the first way we did this was in the hands of Huen Zhu in my lab, in collaboration with Hao Yin and Dan Anderson's lab and C.D. Chen and Phil Sharp's lab with help from Fong Zhang's lab. We did it in the liver 
And we did it in the liver initially because it's easy to, to introduce DNA into the liver by just injecting volumes of that DNA solution into the tail vein. The DNA then goes to the liver and gets transduced in the liver. These plasmids had Cas9 and an sgRNA, and the question was, could we introduce mutations in the cells of the liver directly? And the answer is yes, as published uh, now a little less than a year ago. Um, using sgRNAs against P10, the tumor suppressor gene, we could isolate cells with P10 mutations, and we could confirm that they were mutant by sequencing. If we introduced plasmids with both, uh, with two different plasmids with SGs against P10 or P and P53, the animals would develop cancer, uh, in this case, cholangiocarcinomas, and these cancers had mutations in the four alleles, two P10 alleles and two P53 alleles. So in a single step, in very little time, we could develop a cancer, a cancer in an otherwise wild-type mouse. And in fact, we could also develop gain-of-function mutations, here mutations in beta-catenin, by adding plasmids against beta-catenin, carrying SGs against beta-catenin, and an oligonucleotide that had four base changes that convert beta-catenin from a wild-type gene into an oncogene, and indeed, we could observe beta -catenin, nuclear beta-catenin positive cells. So you can do loss-of-function mutations, you can do gain-of-function mutations, the CRISPR system works remarkably well, much, much better than I expected. So based on the success in that system, uh, Francisco Sanchez Rivera and Thales Papianakopoulos, Papianakopoulos, that's 18 letters, talk about cancer complexity, um, decided to see whether we could make this work in the lung system. And so using the KP model that I've already introduced to you, they developed the PSEC system, which is another bifunctional, it's actually a trifunctional lentiviral vector. It has CRE to do the RASP53 thing, it has Cas9, and it has a spot for an sgRNA. So when you infect these animals with this virus, they'll activate RAS, inactivate p53, and then hopefully mutate the target gene um, to which the sg binds. And they decided to test this against three tumor suppressor genes, NKX2.1, APC, and p10. And quite satisfyingly, in all three cases, we observed increased tumor formation in these animals. Um, the, num the tumor burden in all three cases increased over the control animals. The loss of function, the presumed loss of function of these genes accelerated tumor development as we expected, and the tumor grade increased as well. The tumors progressed more rapidly. Now, I want to point out that this uh, data point is 10 weeks after tumor initiation. This entire study was completed about uh, four months after it was started and about six months after it was conceived. To do this otherwise would have taken us probably two or three years to do. Um, <clears throat> The histology of these tumors is sort of representative of what we'd expect based on our knowledge of the mutations. NKX 2.1 deficient tumors create mucinous uh, histology, as demonstrated here. Uh, the P10 deficient tumors create increased nuclear beta-catenin, uh, I'm sorry, increased uh, P, uh, phospho-AKT staining, increased activation of the PI3 kinase signaling pathway, and APC deficient tumors show increased nuclear beta-catenin, as well as expression of SOX9 indicative of a uh, change in the differentiation state of these tumors. So this is an example of intertumoral heterogeneity, genetic heterogeneity um, precipitated by a very rapid technique uh, involving a very inexp inexpensive um, relative to the alternative uh, protocol. So we're extremely excited about the prospects of using the CRISPR-based system in order to begin to understand the complexities of the human cancer genome and to create designer models with very specific genotypes. So I want to end by telling you one specific story um, that's just emerging in the, in the hands of Thales Pompeianacopoulos as well as Rodrigo Romero and, and Francisco uh, Sanchez Rivera. And that's again coming back to this list created by the TCGA of the commonly mutated genes. We're basically marching our way through this collection of genes. And the gene that I want to focus on initially is called KEEP1. Uh, this is the third most commonly mutated gene in human lung adenocarcinoma. And KEEP1 is a very interesting tumor suppressor gene. It's inactivated in, in human lung cancers and other cancer types. And KEEP1 is a negative regulator of a transcription factor called NERF2. And NERF2 is important to allow the cells to deal with increased reactive oxygen species. So NERF2 drives the expression of detoxifants, detoxicants, that is enzymes which can detoxify um, reactive oxygen species. NERF2 uh, is kept in check by KEEP1. Um, and when you get rid of KEEP1, you increase activity of NERF2 and the NERF2 pathway, and that allows cancer cells to deal with what is thought to be a naturally increasing level of reactive oxygen species. So NERF2 normally is kept in the cytoplasm by binding to KEEP1, 
When KEEP1 gets oxidized because of increased ROS, it releases NERF2. NERF2 then goes into the nucleus, transcribes those target genes, uh, and that leads to increased detoxification. This pathway has actually been explored already by David Tuvison, um, who asked whether constitutive loss of NERF2, the factor that you need to deal with reactive oxygen species, the loss of that constitutively would affect lung tumor development in a KRAS-driven model. And indeed, he observed that it, do that it does. Uh, in contrast to the control animals which develop lung tumors, NERF2 deficient mice develop many fewer and smaller lung tumors. You need NERF2 function in order to deal with the increased reactive oxygen species that build up over time within the tumor. So we decided to look using the PSEC system. And so uh, PSEC vectors were built with, tar with guides against KEEP1 to see whether this would increase tumor formation, and against NERF2 to see whether we could confirm the Tubison result and whether that would inhibit tumor formation. Uh, and then we had a series of experiments that we could do downstream by looking at tumor DNA and, and various other aspects of tumorigenesis. So in fact, the KEEP1 directed uh, guides do the, what, the, what we would expect them to do. This is a presumed tumor suppressor based on the genetics and the biology that we understand it. It should accelerate tumor development, and it does. When you inactivate KEEP1 in this fashion, you get tumors, uh, you get an increased tumor burden, as illustrated here, and you also get increased tumor grade. So we have validated KEEP1 as an important cancer target now in a very simple system. The mutations that we observe in KEEP1 are what you would expect to see. When we sequence the mutations within KEEP1 within these tumors, we find mutant alleles, very often just two mutant alleles, as is shown here in this particular tumor, two predominant alleles, um, one with a frame shift insertion, one with a frame shift deletion. These are biallelic loss of function mutations. Occasionally, you find something that you don't expect. Here, a single mutation. This is probably an example where the gene, one gene got mutated, and the wild type gene was either lost or underwent somatic recombination. Now, if we get rid of KEEP1 in this system, we should hyperactivate NERF2, deregulate NERF2. That should drive the expression of, it tar of its target genes, and that's what we observe, at least in a majority of the tumors. Here, looking at NQ01, which is a target of NERF2, a marker of increased pathway activation, the tumors that lack KEEP1 show increased levels of NQ01. So this all fits. Now, I also mentioned that we targeted NERF2 in the same, in the same series of experiments, and the expectation here was that we would see less tumors, reduced tumor burden, because you th we think we need, one needs uh, NERF2 for tumor development. Surprisingly, that's not what we saw. Uh, in this experiment, the PSEC vectors targeting NERF2 also produced increased tumor burden. This totally went against our expectations. Uh, not only that, we observed increased tumor grade as well. So somehow, mutation of NERF2 was phenocopying mutation of KEEP1, and that didn't make a lot of sense. But in fact, maybe it did, because although I haven't told you, KEEP1 is also mutated in human cancers. It's not mutated to loss of function, it's actually mutated to gain of function. KEEP1 mutations are point mutations, they're substitution mutations. They're mutations that are in the domain that NERF2 uses to bind to KEEP1. And so one way to activate NERF2 is to create mutations in this site which liberate NERF2 from KEEP1. It turns out, uh, and that, that's illustrated here, that domain is illustrated here, it turns out that that was the very domain that we were targeting with the sgRNAs in this experiment. And so the possibility existed that the tumor cells were selecting for specific mutations that were preserving NERF2 function, but getting rid of that domain that's required for uh, KEEP1 binding. And so in ongoing work, we're characterizing the alleles present within these tumors. And indeed, at least some of the tumors carry clear deletion mutations. This particular deletion mutation was checked to see its specific sequence. It takes out the whole of exon 2. That carries that domain required for, for KEEP1 binding. 264 nucleotide exon, 88 amino acids. The expectation would create an in-frame deletion. And indeed, by Western blotting, we can see protein of the expected size, and if we look in the tumors that carry that mutant allele, we find NQ01 staining. So keep uh, NERF2 activity is preserved and, in fact, constitutive. So the tumor selects for the mutations that it needs. Um, whether we think we're producing loss of function, sometimes we're actually producing gain of function. Now, if that's true, then perhaps if we deny the cell the ability to make that particular mutation, 
um, we would observe the expected effect. And so in contrast to tra targeting exon 2, as I showed you before, we can also target exon 1. And in this case, eliminate the possibility of creating such a deletion allele. And when we do that, in fact, the animals develop fewer tumors. So the system can also be used to probe genes whose function is required for tumor development. So I'll close there and just show this summary slide of this particular experiment, but I think this provides a game plan for how we're going to prosecute cancer targets in the future. With a pathway such as this of interest, we can use this PSEC system and related systems to create series of animals with particular tumors of particular genotypes now relatively easily, study the biology of those tumors in the ways that we know how to do. In addition, in parallel, we can create cell lines with specific mutations isogenic pairs of cell lines with particular combinations of mutations of interest to us based on the human cancer genetics. Using those cell lines, we can then carry out various synthetic lethal screens with chemicals or sgRNAs or what have you. And then with the hits that come from that, we can then validate those hits in the in vivo model, again, relatively easily. And once we find genes and pathways that are important in cancer cells of particular genotypes, hopefully that will inform the development of uh, new therapeutics for human lung cancer. So I'll stop there and just show a slide of all the individuals who've contributed to the work that I've told you today, as well as a series of collaborators. I thank them very much, and thank you very much.